So good evening, everybody. He tells me to say today. Good to see you today, and then it won't matter if it's morning or evening, but uh, it's a good point, ain't it? Some of these kids are sharper than you think they are, you know? <laughs> Us preachers get some help from the little ones, believe it or not. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined that not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Let's pray. Father, I, I love you, Lord. I thank you so much for being such a great Savior, such a good God. And Lord, I'm happy to be here tonight. I, I love this book in front of me. Uh, I appreciate, God, you um, giving me your words. I appreciate you putting men in my life that cared enough to teach me and put up with me and, and help me with that. And God, I thank you for your spirit that leads us through it. I thank you, Lord, for truth. And God, I want to love the truth more with each passing day. I want to take my job more seriously with each passing day. And I pray, God, now that tonight you'd be with us. We thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for giving us a great service. I realize that there were some folks in the room that are not saved yet, and I pray, Father, you'd work on their hearts and minds and help them to realize, Lord, that uh, the preaching may be straight, the talk may be pretty straight here, but that we love them, help them to recognize that and to sense that and to, Lord, be drawn back to the light of the Word of God and the, to the light of this church to the light of Jesus Christ, and may we see more souls saved. Uh, God, I don't get tired of seeing people get saved. It sure is encouraging. And I thank you, Lord, they're not just getting saved and taking off, but they're getting saved and sticking around and learning to love the truth and love good preaching. And, and Lord, I just am thankful for that, and I pray you'd help them to grow, help them to stay in the Word of God, help them to, to keep listening to preaching throughout the week and being faithful to come to the church attendance and to the church uh, uh, meetings, Lord, and I pray, Father, you'd help them to grow, help those that made some decisions today and were publicly baptized, publicly being a testimony of their faith in Jesus Christ. I pray that you'd help them, God, to not forget this day, but to, to commit to you and to grow and to stay faithful. I pray for the young people, Lord, this week. We got this youth thing coming up, and I pray, God, that you'd help them to have an unforgettably good time. But beyond that, God, I ask you please to anoint the preachers with the Word of God, with your Holy Spirit, with power. And I pray that, Lord, the young people would get some help that they need, God. We don't want to lose our kids. We don't want to see this world get our kids, Lord. And I pray they learn to fall in love with truth and to love your Word. And, God, that you do a work here that will, will last, Lord, that will even outlast us if you should tarry. Now speak to our hearts, we pray, as we go through this chapter, and I pray you'd help me to be able to teach uh, with the touch of God on it and with some clarity of thought, be with my mind, be with my mouth, and help me to be able to uh, be a help and a blessing and make sense of these things, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now you'll notice, picking up here in chapter number 2, Paul starts out with a, kind of a little bit of a rerun at what he'd already said in chapter 1. He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, now, reminding you again that the Corinthian culture and in that day and time, they were all about their arts. They were all about their speeches. They were all about the theater and the entertainment of the day. Uh, Corinth being a very wealthy city and a very kind of like upscale city, they were very culturally refined would be a great way to put it. And they were all about that kind of entertainment. You know, the rougher crowd had their gladiatorial games and that kind of stuff they could go see and a lot of sporting events and, and then a lot of the finer, you know, speeches and orders. And they wouldn't go to a movie theater like we would today, but they would go to the theater and hear speeches from great orders who had a tremendous ability to manipulate speech. Don't forget the philosophical influence and the educational influence and all that was going on there in that culture in that day. And Paul then is coming to the church at Corinth and he's trying to whip them back into shape because although they're the most gifted church in the New Testament, they're the most carnal church in the New Testament at the same time. They've got the truth, but they very quickly after Paul left, very quickly did they shoot right downhill and run right back into the mess, culturally speaking, that they had come out of. And so Paul is, now, now what they're doing is they're meshing Jesus in the culture. They're meshing church in the culture. And they're ridiculously carnal because they're full of division. And Paul's upset about this. We're going to see it when we get into 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The Bible actually defines for us what a carnal Christian is. You've heard a lot of preaching over the years, or a lot of you have, about carnality. 
And it's like, well, what is carnality? Well, it's carnivore. It comes from the flesh. It's fleshly. And then, and then the preaching from there leads to, and this is the dangers in topical preaching, the preaching from there leads to, okay, I take this one thought or this one word and I go to the definition of it in a modern definition and then I take that modern definition and I just run my thought on it and now I'm going to make the Bible fit what I want it to say. So I could tell you not to be carnal and if you do this, 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 and that, you're carnal. Now, now let me just... Call the baby ugly, okay? Smoking is wrong. Do you understand that? It's a sin. Your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit. We tell our kids all the time, I know, it, smoking won't kill you because we're going to first. Okay? It's not, I'm not pulling the punch on smoking, but I'm going to say this. I know some Christians that struggled for a long time with cigarettes that weren't carnal Christians. They had a fleshly addiction that stuck with them after they got saved, and they tried really hard to stop, and they hated it. And they knew it was wrong, and it's not okay. It's a sin. They're under conviction about it. But I've had some faithful folks, folks in my church for a long time that never caused me a bit of problems that had that addiction for a long time. So, well, that's a carnal. You're a carnal if you're a smoker. Well, what's the Bible definition of the word? In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he spells it out. We'll see it soon. He said, For where is there an envy and strife and division among you? Are you not carnal and walk as men? God defined the word for you right there. Now, you cannot drink, not smoke, not chew, and you shouldn't do any of that stuff. And you can listen to only good music, and you should. You've heard me preach on it before. And you can have all the standards in the world and still be as carnal as a goat. While a Christian sitting across from you struggles with some of those other things that you don't struggle with, and they're not carnal at all. They're just caught in an addiction that they need to get out of that's bad for them, and it's also bad for their testimony. And they know it. But you'll have carnal Christians in church full of envy, strife, and division, and won't have any idea at all that they're carnal or that they've gotten far from God over the years. Now, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm preaching now. I'm supposed to be teaching tonight, but I can't help it. It's part of what I am. God says to be apt to teach, so I'm like doing my job to teach, but it just comes, you know what I'm saying? That stuff aggravates the fire out of me. I'm, I'm not trying to be mean or rude or hurtful, but for years I've struggled since I was a kid with an obese preacher getting in the pulpit and beating on people that struggle with cigarettes. Beating on people that struggle with alcoholism. Drunkenness, if you want the Bible word for it. I, I've had a hard time with that. That, you're not, we're not properly defining things according to the word of God. This is a carnal church, and they're carnal because it's envy, strife, and division. It's I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. Now listen to me for a second. I am not ashamed of the men God put in my life to help me. And if somebody labels me, oh, you're a Ruckmanite, I accept it gladly with a gleeful smile on my face. I have a distinct privilege. I can very quickly tell what crowd I'm in. And if I wanted to be a chameleon, it would be very easy for me. If I'm around a Bob Jones guy, I went to Bob Jones. If I'm around the middle ground TR guys, oh, I went to Crown College. And if I'm about the ra around the rabid, blood-sucking Ruckmanites, hey, I went to Brother Lentz's school. But see, I got the exact opposite nature. I get around the Ruckmanites, and I'm like, I went to BJ. And I get around the TR guys, and I'm like, I went to the Ruckmanite school. Because you don't want to know something, folks. None of that really matters at all. What matters is the Word of God. That's what matters. The reason I separated from some of those other crowds is because of a Bible issue. It's not about the man's name. It's about the truth of the Word of God. I'm not ashamed of the people that God put in my life to bring me where I'm at, but it's not about the man's name. You're understanding what I'm saying, right? It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not here like, well, if you're a Bible believer and I'm a Bible believer, we have no business coming at each other about our differences because we will find our differences. I guarantee you that. And carnal people focus on all the differences. I never forget years ago, I was talking to Brother Sowell, and it was just he and I in his office, and I had that, I had that, that, that spirit still about me that I try very hard not to have nowadays, but I still had that problem. And I remember bringing up something. I don't, don't remember exactly what it was, but I remember it being one of those issues. And he said something to me that I never will forget. He sat back in his chair and he looked at me and he said, Mike, if you and I have, agree on 90 things and disagree on 10, I figure I got 90 things to talk to you about. 
And I thought, well, now in the world, how in the world do you answer that? You know, I mean, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. Like, nice meeting with you. We'll see you later. I'm out of here. <laughs> you know? Well, folks, that really is the right spirit. Right. You believe the King James Bible? Sure. You believe Jesus Christ is a Savior? Sure. You want to serve Him? You want to please Him? You want to do right? You love Him? Sure. Well, so do I. Do you vaccinate? I'm touching on that again, you guys, because that's a very hot topic right now. Understandably so. Don't get me going. It's scary to see what's happening, isn't it? So let me ask you a question. You're going to have to deal with this at work. You're going to have to deal with this in your family. You're going to have to deal with this by your friends. And it's this controversial, divisive aggravated, angry spirit, isn't it? Why in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ would we bring it into the church? Is that what God wants? Do you vaccinate? None of your business. Do you not vaccinate? None of my business. None of your business. In case you're wondering, I haven't got it yet. My employer hasn't made me. We don't have more than 100 employees, so <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> but if you did, you think I got a problem with you over that? That ain't the Lord, man. Well, folks, we got enough problems, don't we? We need a safe place to come that's going to be all about something much bigger than us. And all the garbage going on in our world today. Paul said in the first verse, I didn't come to you with excellency of speech. I didn't come to you showing off. I remind you again in our introduction, if Paul wanted to show off, he could have showed off, man. There ain't nobody out there with the education and the intellect and everything else that that man had. The drive and the success in a worldly sense that that man had. He could have wowed him like nobody else could have wowed him. He is a freaky looking little guy, according to the historians. He would grab your attention just because he's so ugly and so short. Paul means small and so short and blind on top of that. He had to be some funny looking dude and beat half to death and scars all over his back. He limped like nobody in this room limps. Talk about the pain that man was in. And I'm sure he wasn't using medicinal marijuana, even if it was legal. That man lived in pain for the name of Jesus Christ. He could, have, he could have got their attention. And he said, I made up my mind when I came to you. I wasn't coming to show off. I was just going to come and do one thing, and that was declare unto you the testimony of God. This is the only time in your Bible, or one of the few times in your Bible, the word, de uh, no, determined is in verse number two. That's the only time that that one shows up in your Bible. He says he's going to declare unto you the testimony of God. He's not worried about showing off with his excellency of speech. Go back with me, please, to the book of Isaiah. I want you to see something. Here's something kind of I find interesting when I read my Bible. Isaiah, look at chapter 58. <clears throat> you saw this morning how it said about, in, uh, in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah, he said in Matthew chapter 12, how he wasn't going to raise his voice in the streets. You see that? Remember this morning? And I didn't have time to get to that. Man, if I pre preached everything that was in there, I'd preach for like three hours when I only preached for one. You know, why don't you cut your messages down? You don't understand. I do. To fit it all in an hour. There's so much in this book that it's just mind-boggling. It's amazing. If I gave you everything God gives me in my studies, it, we'd be here all night. And I know you don't want that. So uh, Isaiah chapter 58. So you got Jesus over there saying he wouldn't lift his voice in the streets, right? And so a lot of people will come in and they hear a Bible preacher who gets fired up. And they'll say, well, Jesus didn't lift his voice in the streets. It's funny how some biblical midgets, theological dunces, happen to know certain verses when they want to manipulate somebody or try to get them to do something they want them to do or not do something they don't want them to do. It's unbelievable to me. So they'll grab that one verse. Well, Jesus would never talk like that. Did you see that? I mean, he was spitting. He was stomping. He was pounding on the pulpit. That's a sacred desk. Look at Isaiah 58. Cry aloud. See it? Spare not. But that, what's that? He says, don't hold back. Let it fly. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Now how about that? God's telling Isaiah, let it rip. Lift up your voice, cry aloud, shake them out of their sleep. 
excellency of speech, wisdom. He's acting like a nut. Spare not. You know it's in your nature to hold back when people are around. Right? To kind of like maintain your composure a little bit. To make sure that you're looking professional and educated and appropriate and, right? And that's what you got in churches all over this nation today is professional, educated, appropriate looking, making sure they're fitting in with the culture. Paul said, I don't care about the culture. I determined I'm not worrying about the culture. What I'm going to do is I'm determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I'm giving you Jesus Christ and I'm coming straight at you with it. And I'm not worried whether you think I'm educated or not educated. I'm giving you the truth and I'm not holding back the truth. I'm not here to fit the culture. That stuff's of the devil, folks. And you know what you got today? We got a lot on, the, on a more formal religion this morning if you weren't catching that. We got quite a bit on that formalistic religion, that pharisaical stuff, right? That's your Roman Catholicism and some of your Protestant movements and all the rest of that stuff. Now tonight we're kind of getting on the contemporary culture. That stuff, folks, in making the church fit the world, that was what Paul was fighting against all the way back here when he wrote 1 Corinthians. Well, the Bible's not relevant. Well, you don't know the Bible if you think that. You haven't studied at all. This is extremely relevant. Paul is fighting against the contemporary culture that came into the church at Corinth. And he's saying, no, I'm not doing it the way you want me to do it. Go with me over to the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 6. Keep going to your right, you'll find the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 6. Look at another example. Look at verse 11. Ezekiel 6, 11. Thus saith the Lord God, Smite with thine hand, and stamp with thy foot, and say, Alas, for all the evil abominations of the house of Israel, for they shall fall by the sword, and by famine, and by pestilence. When they're in a point, at a point of judgment, when they're about to fall, when the judgment of God is coming and it's not going to get better, God calls men to show up on the scene and absolutely go bonkers. Now, you think I'm exaggerating it. Stay with me. I'm going to show you another passage. I'm not exaggerating it at all. God calls on men in those kind of times to come in there without any fear at all. I think it was Jeremiah, wasn't it, where he said, I make that forehead like flint. Make them hard-headed to go right up against them and just preach the truth. Folks, we need today more than ever Bible preaching. Our children need to know what it is to hear Bible preaching. When visitors come into this church or scope us online, they need to see something they're not seeing everywhere else they go. They need to hear something they're not hearing everywhere else they go. They need to recognize, man, I might not like him. He might be loud and obnoxious. I might not like his style. I'm sure I can't control him, but something about that was different. And it ought to stick in their crawl a little bit, making them stop and think about life and think about sin and think about Jesus Christ and think about where they're going and think about what they're doing. Something that sticks in them. We'll get to that in just a minute. The sword of the Spirit. That's what God's calling men to do today. And the problem is men aren't manly enough to do what God called them to do anymore. They're more afraid of, of pacifying the old ladies and pacifying the old men, hoping that they'll give their money and making sure that they're not rattling the mama's cages because nowadays churches are full of mamas. And if you can get mama in church, she'll nag the old man enough to make sure that they tip every week. And they're more worried about that than they are about preaching the truth of the word of God. Paul said, I'm not worried about the culture. I'm not worried about showing off how smart I am. I determined, I made up my mind. I'm not going to know anything among you. Don't you know that nowadays people don't accept that? Don't have any idea what you're talking about. I don't know nothing, but Jesus Christ is a savior. The King James Bible is the word of God. And that's what you're getting when you come here. And I'm going to lift up my voice because you want to fall asleep all the time. I like it. Sometimes I'm a little strategic about when I go, and I'm looking over here, but I'm watching over there. You know what I'm saying? It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> gotcha. Why do you stomp? Why do you snore? <laughs> when you get in a generation that's fallen away from God and not interested in the Bible anymore, you can't have people in the pulpit that are holding back. Spare not. 
lift up thy voice like a trumpet. And I'm telling you this much, I still believe with all my heart God is still calling men to do a job that's a man's job. I know that's politically incorrect, but I could care less. I am not interested in being equal with my wife. I said it before, I'll say it again. We wouldn't have four daughters if we were equals. You can figure out what I mean. Hey, I'm not being crude. God didn't design us to be equal. We're different and we're supposed to be. Preaching is a man's job according to the Bible. And it's supposed to have with it some persecution, some kickback, some people that don't like you, some problems that come with it. It's a, the, the, the command to be a soldier, you know who that's to in the New Testament? That's to the preacher. Some of the brethren think they got to turn their whole church into soldiers, but that ain't Bible. You're in Ezekiel chapter 6. Go back to Ezekiel chapter 4. Want to see a wild one? I'll show you the excellency of speech and man's wisdom. You want to see how God works? Ezekiel 4, look at verse 1. Thou also, son of man, take thee a tile, and lay it before thee, and portray upon it the city, even Jerusalem. And lay siege against it, build a fort against it, cast a mount against it, set a camp also against it, and set battering rams against it round about. Moreover, take, thee, take thou unto thee an iron pan, and set it for, an iron, for a wall of iron between thee and the city. Set thy face against it, and it shall be besieged, and thou shalt lay siege against it. This shall be a sign to the house of Israel. Watch this, it gets wilder. So he's supposed to create this little, this little uh, display. You know, we're going to have our children are going to do an arts and crafts for the church tonight. You know, here, here's your arts and crafts. God's preacher's doing it. Verse 4, lie also on thy left side. And lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of days thou shalt lie upon it, and thou shalt bear their iniquity. I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days, three hundred and ninety days. So shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel, laying on your left side for three hundred and ninety days. Now, you, wait, you think about that for a minute. You can't get past 40 and lay on your left side for an hour and a half without tossing and turning, right? Can I get a witness? doesn't work. God, can you imagine the pain the man was in? God said, lay there for 390 days. And everybody's walking by, what's that lunatic doing, man? That guy's crazy. Get the kids away. He's a nut. He, that guy needs to see a psychologist. Oh, my goodness. He needs his meds. God says, just lay there. It gets worse. When thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side. And thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of, Israel, of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. Now switch to your right and lay there for forty days. Therefore thou shalt set thy face toward the siege of Jerusalem, and thine arm shall be uncovered, and thou shalt prophesy against it. And behold, I will lay bands upon thee, and thou shalt not turn thee from one side to the other till thou hast ended the days of thy siege. <laughs> Wait a minute. It gets worse. Take thou also unto thee wheat and barley and beans and lentils and millet and fitches and put them in one vessel and make thee bread thereof. According to the number of days that thou shalt lie upon thy side, 390 days shalt thou eat thereof. So this is what you're going to eat. Make sure you get it prepared and ready so you can eat of this. And thy meat which thou shalt eat shall be by weight. 20 shekels a day from time to time shalt thou eat it. So those of you that make fun of us for counting calories, there you go. You'll get that later. Thou shalt drink also water by measure. The sixth part of a hen from time to time shalt thou drink. And thou shalt eat it as barley cakes, and thou shalt bake it with dung that cometh out of a man in their sight. God said, Ezekiel, what I want you to do is go to Israel in the excellency of speech and wisdom. Now I want you to make sure you understand the culture of the day and graciously, gently, sweetly give them the truths of the coming judgment. You seeing what I'm seeing about God? Are you seeing what I'm seeing about God's men? About God's commandments? Ezekiel says in the passage, God, uh, please, man. <laughs> that's a bit much. Can I just testify? That's a bit much. Most of you heard my septic tank story. We got in that new house and, you know, they put in the new septic field before we moved in. And nowadays they put a filter in at the exit of the tank before the, fl before the leach field, right? Well, one morning, man, I mean, we went down the basement. 
I go over there and pull that door open and I look over there where the exit pipe is going out to the tank and there's a little, about the size of a small dinner plate, there's a little spot on the floor and you can see that pipe just, and I'm like, oh no, man, they put in a whole new septic before we moved in, brand new septic. I got two fields, I'm supposed to switch back and forth, so they said, oh, last you the rest of your life. I mean, we've been there a couple months, six months maybe. I run outside, I take the lid off that tank and when I pull the lid off that tank, it's right there about to overflow into the yard. And I call that guy, I say, hey, man, <clears throat> what in the world's going on? He said, how many kids you got? I said, four. How old are they? I told him. He said, are they girls or boys? I said, girls. He said, how many girls? I said, they're all girls. He said, oh, my blankety, blankety, blank. I never seen that blankety, blank thing fail that fast. That filter just saved your septic field. Dude, listen. Right now, you got to reach down in there and grab that filter and pull it out. I said, huh? Come again? <laughs> he said, you don't want that pipe in your basement to give way. Is that a finished basement? I said, yep. He said, you got to get that out, man. Sorry to tell you. I said, where is it? He said, you're going to have to reach down there and feel around, but it should be on the, the north side of that tank. I, folks, I was in my yard. And you, know, you notice I'm not a really tall guy? I was in that puppy up to here, man. I mean, my armpit was in it. And I'm reaching around there, and I <coughs> found that puppy, and I pulled it out, and it went whoosh. And that filter was caked with hair. My arm, my arm smelled after like three or four baths and all kinds of other stuff, scraping and rubbing, and my skin smelled for a couple of days. Listen, that's bad enough. But I'm so glad that guy didn't say, you got to stick a straw in there yeah. and start. <laughs> <laughs> now are you feeling for Ezekiel? <laughs> Can you imagine, folks? And God says, this is what I want you to do. So Ezekiel calls upon the mercy of God, and God says, all right, I'll be merciful to you. You're going to bake it in cow's dung. That's in verse 15. So he bakes it in cow's dung, and he eats it. Well, how's that for excellency of speech and fitting in with the culture? Do you understand what I'm saying, church? It's just not the way God works. You get the point? It's not how God makes his points. Thankfully, what God's doing in the New Testament is not requiring me to go down there when the, the transvestites are there in town and having the little thing about come and I'll have story time with the drag, which they just had a couple months ago in South Lyon. Thankfully, God didn't tell me, I want you to go down there and I want you to walk around with a septic tank smoothie and I want you to walk through there going, this is what you guys like to live on. That's what you're teaching your kids. You see that? It's what you're teaching your kids. That's what you are, sir. That's what you are, ma'am, whatever you are. It... God didn't call me to do that, see? Isn't that a blessing? You know what he told us to do now? Give him Jesus. Preach Jesus. Not with the excellency of speech, just give him Jesus. And you know what we're not giving him? We're not giving him Jesus. We're so worried about being correct, politically correct and love and this, that, and the other thing. They come to church and you say a prayer. And listen, what is giving him Jesus? I'm going to show you. You know, I'm not making anywhere near the time I want to make, but it's all right. We got the rest of our lives until Jesus comes, right? I'm going to show you as we go through this chapter, giving them Jesus, you can't do that accurately without giving them Bible. They go hand in hand. You don't, you don't have, without one, you don't have the other. You understand that? You don't have a Bible without Jesus Christ, and you don't have Jesus Christ without a Bible. You can't do it. Nowadays, we have this culture of come to church and give them Jesus, put a scripture up on the screen, and let's make sure that we make it cool and hip, and we got a cool hip preacher who's got his shirt sleeves rolled up just enough to show his tat kind of coming out of the sleeve a little bit so he's cool, you know what I mean? Hey, if you got tats, you got them. I don't care. I don't have any. But if I did, it would be like, it was, it's in the past. That's not now. It's, not, it's neither here nor there. But I'm not going to use it as marketing to try to make you see how cool and hip I am so we're fit with the culture. Forget that garbage. You know what you need? You know what our kids need? You know what your friends need? Your family needs? They need Jesus. You don't have to be wiser than them and smarter than them. For I determined, verse 2, not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Look at verse 3. And I was with you in weakness and in fear 
and in much trembling. Paul? The greatest Christian ever? Arguably so, yes. Was no different than you. If you went back and read, we're not going to for the sake of time, but if we went back and read Acts chapter 18, when Paul was in that city, God showed up and said, Listen, don't be afraid, for I'm with thee. No man shall set on thee to do thee hurt, for I have much people in this city. You know why God, when he showed up, told Paul, don't be afraid? Because God saw Paul was afraid. Can anybody relate with that in this generation? I mean, it's like a lot of good questions buzzing around, like mandating vaccines or you can't work. So how far of a step is it from that to taking a marker you can't buy or sell? I'd say that step is only as far as the trumpet. <laughs> so if the trumpet's like 200 years out, then it's like 200 years worth of steps. But if the trumpet's tonight, it's like next week. You know what? Here's how we're going to make sure everybody's got the vaccine. Get a mark. I mean, tattoos are the thing nowadays. Your average house mom gets a tattoo or a whole bunch of them. I mean, I'm not, if you got, we got tattoos all over this place, just so you know, okay? Somebody came to me, I described one particular tattoo that I saw from <laughs> on the back of an MMA fighter, and I went preaching against it, and somebody walked up to me and said, so pastor hates my tattoo. I'm like, huh? He's like, yeah, I told you that when I first came here, that that's what I got on my back. <laughs> I was like, oh, man, that was one of those nights I laid down to go to sleep, and I couldn't sleep, and I'm like, oh, God, please help me. I, I, did, I didn't mean to offend the guy. <laughs> it's terrible. So I'm not harping on you about it, but I am saying it's not that big of a deal anymore to get a mark. Years ago, it was. Nowadays, you're business professionals, cops. I mean, I trained with a few cops and got them all over. Used to be against the rules. It's not, you, you, you say, oh, it's a small step. Yeah, I know, I know. And if you get thinking about that and you keep going down that road, and if you start bringing that into the equation of whether or not I'm going to lose my job right now or just take the vaccine and what I'm going to do, and you start pulling doctrine to the tribulation period into the present, you're going to be more than just slightly disturbed. You're going to be tore up every which way. I've been teaching you as best as I know how, and I'm trying to get better, how to rightly divide the word of truth and how to accurately apply doctrine at the right time. It is not possible for you to receive the mark. You understand that, right? Because God's calling you out first. So if you decide, I'm going to vaccinate so I don't lose my job, that's your business. And if you decide I'm not going to vaccinate because it goes against my conscience for whatever list of reasons, and there's a lot of good reasons, then great. But doctrinally, that stuff ain't the issue right now. You got all kinds of things working you up and getting you full of fear. And with that pressure building up and the distractions of it, we forget what we're really here to do. So maybe tomorrow when you go to work, instead of getting on the political bandwagon, bandwagon with your lost co-workers, hello? Maybe you could determine not to know anything among them save Jesus Christ and him crucified because that is how he works right now. That is his agenda in this day and this time. And honestly, it, it doesn't matter even if you win the political debate with your coworker, even if the, tr the flag I saw yesterday is accurate and it's Trump 2024 and he's driving through with a big old truck with the huge jacked up wheels and the big old flag in the back. You know, like, I'm like, oh boy, here we go, man. This is going to get real. I mean, Lord help us. Even if that happens, may I remind you, President Trump was not the answer to the problems of this nation when he got in years ago. Because as soon as he got out, what happened? While he was in, what happened? You understand there's a God of this world running the show and it ain't President Trump. And he's sitting there trying to steer the ship and coronavirus hits. And he's going, whoa, <laughs> nothing's turning. And I'm going to try to spin it all to make it good to get myself in and keep myself in and get myself back in. And how'd that work? Did the election get stealed or didn't it? Stole or didn't it? What difference does it actually make either way? It happened. Is it going to happen again or not? There's somebody in control of this whole thing a lot bigger than the politicians, folks. They're, they're just pawns. They're nothing. They're men.
Haven't you noticed they're men? Some of them can't remember what they said last or what they're supposed to say next. You know what I mean? They're just men. That's all I'm saying. I mean, I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. But I'm just saying they're just men. Folks, that's not the stuff. That's not what we're about. It really, a soft answer turneth away wrath. But grievous words stir up anger. So you're more worried about Trump 2024 than you are Jesus or the Trumpet 2024. Do you get my point, what I, the point I just made? Somebody stirred up them liberals for four years, but a soft answer turneth away wrath. You know what the Bible says about the rich? He answereth roughly. You know why? Because he's rich and he doesn't need you. You need him. I don't have to be nice to nobody because I got the money. You do understand, right? American pride, America first, America first. I get the net, I get the patriotism. I'm not, not, I'm not knocking anybody for that. I love the police, I love the military, but I'm just preaching right now about what really matters. Determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. If anybody had a right to be patriotic and political in his preaching, it would have been Jesus Christ, right? Have you ever read the approach he took? Go with him, Twain. The conquering army. If he bid you to, to bear his uh, cloak or whatever it was, a mile, go with him, Twain. Read under Caesar. Caesar? Yes, yeah, Caesar. That wasn't a Jewish tax. Read under Caesar, the things that are Caesar, and it's under God, God's. So I don't believe in Christians not paying their taxes. Well, it's going to all the liberal... Same arguments that some people are going to use for whether or not they do or don't do other things. you got to grab a hold of what I'm saying to you. You're in this world. If you get all worked up about this world and start nitpicking at every little thing, you are going to be in such a mess, you're not going to have any strength at all. Paul had the same struggle. He said, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech, verse 4, and my preaching was not with enticing words. That's very interesting. If you want to later on your own, go do a Bible study on enticing words. That's the way the devil works. That's the way evil spirits work. They come before the throne and says, who's going to go out and deceive them? I'll go with enticing words. That's an evil spirit. He said, I'm not coming to you with enticing words of man's wisdom. So let me give you, let me give you some of the red flags so you can spot them if you ever hear them. Here's one of the red flags of enticing words of man's wisdom. Well, in the Greek, this word is paraclete. Parakeet? Like, what are you talking about? You know what he's doing? He's trying to show off his seminary education. He's trying to show you that he's closer to God and knows the Bible better than you possibly ever could because he knows a language that you don't know, which the Bible was originally written in. And all he's ever studied of those languages are copies of 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 copies. And he has his faith in copies of copies of copies of copies in a dead language that doesn't exist anywhere on the planet today. And people sit there in the pews and go, ooh, ah. You know, preachers, preachers' pay brackets are based on years in the ministry, experience level, education. And if he's got a higher education, the higher his education, the more the church is supposed to pay him. Corinthians. Corinthians. That's, that's wicked, man. That ain't of God. He said, I didn't come to you with enticing words of man's wisdom. I wasn't trying to show off how smart I am. But in the demonstration of the Spirit, with a capital S, and power. Now, wait a second. Go with me to Luke chapter 4. Let me show you a couple things about that. Luke chapter number 4. Look at, verse, uh, look at verse 32. Luke 4, 32. And they were astonished at his doctrine. Now, doctrine is teaching, right? They were astonished at his doctrine. The first application of Scripture, it's profitable for, number one, doctrine. That's the first thing you need to know. 
Doctrine comes before reproof and correction and before instruction in righteousness. Because I can get up here and skip doctrine and start reproving and rebuking you. And I can say, if you mere make up, you're like Jezebel. I've heard that stuff preached. And pull a passage out of the Old Testament, she painted her face. And that's the one passage, and I pull it out of context, and I preach that makeup's the si a sin. Listen, if your personal conviction is not to wear makeup, I support that. If you feel like I don't believe God wants me to wear makeup, if you're one of those, you know, you want to, you know, <laughs> the preachers always make jokes about this stuff. If the bar needs paint and paint it, you know, if you're one of those that likes to wear makeup, your husband's all right with it. You got a Bible for me? No. No, not either way. Wear makeup. You don't answer to me anyhow. You're not, I'm not going to be like, brother, I've noticed lately your wife's mascara. <laughs> I mean, you come to me like that, and I'm going to be like, what are you looking so close for? You're going to need some mascara to cover up that mess I'm going to make on your face. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying, right? I can reprove and rebuke you based on my preferences like we dealt with this morning, but that's not the first application of Scripture. You know the devil can jump in that stuff? I mean, jump right in it. You get a girl that just got saved from a rough background, been around the block a million times, man, and I'm just going to be out there with this for a second because it needs to be said, and I'm going to be tactful. But some of the places people are coming from today would blow the mind of those who've had a good marriage, been raised by good parents. You have to understand that some of, these, some of these people that are walking in the doors of our churches today were abused beyond what can even be said publicly. You, you get that, right? You can't take somebody like that and immediately start preaching at her, embroidered hair! She's going to be like, what in the world are you talking about? You are crazy. They need, they need a little bit of Jesus Christ and him crucified. They need a little bit of this is a Bible. This is an Old Testament. This is a New Testament. And, and there's things back here that are written for our learning, but you don't have to do them, so please don't bring a lamb in next Sunday and slit its throat, okay? Please. We're talking about basic, rightly dividing and beginning to learn how to read their Bible and how to apply it. Doctrine. Teaching. Then when you show the doctrine, you begin the reproof based on what the Bible teaches. Rightly divided, properly and practically applied. Correction. Instruction and in righteousness based off of doctrine. You have to start with doctrine. Jesus Christ says this, they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. He said, when I came to you, I came in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. You know what he has given them? He has given them the word, obviously. Look at Matthew chapter 22. You're in Luke. Go back to Matthew chapter number 22. You know what I genuinely believe with all my heart? I believe, I believe this. I believe that if we give people today Bible, I'm talking Bible, and listen, what that requires from the preacher is work. You can't get up here Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, three times a week on a regular basis and shoot from the hip and actually teach people their Bible and give them something fresh and give them Bible I mean, if you don't, if a preacher doesn't, you'll get it quick. It's the, it's the same message from a different text, and it's the same pet topics all the time. And before long, you can tune the message out before it even starts. If you give them Bible, the Bible is very interesting. The ones that won't stay are the ones that just don't want truth anyhow. The ones that are struggling or are being pulled by the devil, the best chance they got is getting them in here and giving them Bible. We, we won't lose a whole generation. Well, might lose some. That's their own fault. 
But you're not necessarily going to lose a whole generation just because, well, we just went to a church that just preached the Bible, so now my kids have PTSD and they're all dying and, you know, they're out of church because that preacher preached so hard. The Bible's interesting. It's, it's funny to me to watch these kids sit in here and pay completely close attention, and not every time, but you'd be shocked how often, from my perspective, the kids are all making eye contact with me. I just clap, just clap the hand, stomp at the foot, and eat cow dung in the pulpit, and they'll stare, you know. <laughs> Matthew chapter 22, look at verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err. What's their error? Not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. See what he just said in 1 Corinthians 2? I came unto you how? In the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And when you look at Jesus, he said the Scripture's in power. You getting it? I just want the power of God on my life. You don't read your Bible enough. I want to preach with power. You ain't ever going to preach with power, you topical little preacher. You little midget. I don't care if you're six foot five and 400 pounds and squash me before I leave. You're a midget spiritually. You can't have the power of God without having the Spirit of God, and you don't have the Spirit of God without the Word of God. Period. He said, your problem is you don't know the Scriptures and you don't know the power of God. Now, wait a minute. The power of God to preserve the Scriptures. How about that? You know what I hold in my hand right now? What Paul told Timothy had? From a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. You know what Paul was holding? Copies of copies of copies of copies of copies of copies of copies that had been passed down for centuries. He was not holding originals. Like Timothy's walking around with the Ten Commandments. Look at this, guys! As a little kid. But that's what they lie to you and say with man's words of wisdom. And you go, oh yeah, that's true. It's just been copied and passed down for centuries. And there's got to be errors in the Bible. How can we know for sure we have the truth? Because it's been copied and translated. And when you translate from one language to the next language, not every word translates. So how do we know we have every word? It has to be in the originals. You're, you're a theological dunce. I don't, care if his, I don't care if his IQ is 200. That is the most ignorant and stupid thing I ever heard somebody who's supposed to be called to preach saying publicly and taking himself seriously. The problem is you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. If God can put the sun in the sky and make it rise and set and hang the earth on nothing and <sighs> God did that. I can't even do that. You know, I mean, I can, <sighs> but I mean, if without God, there's no way I can even keep doing that. That's God. You understand that? That's almighty God. I mean, you, you just look around. If God can do all that he does and all that he's done, it is a very minute thing that God kept us a perfect Bible. I don't have to come to you, well, where's the proof? Where's the man's wisdom? I'll show you the man's wisdom. Open that Bible and watch God speak to your heart while I'm preaching. Watch God get in your personal business when I have no idea what went on in your life and he'll do it week after week after week, month after month, and year after year. God will get in your thoughts that nobody knows you had. in a church service where the Bible's preached. And the preacher will go home as clueless as your neighbor's cat. No idea what God just did with him, through him, in his church, in his people. No idea. Because it's not about Paul, Apollos, Cephas. It's about Jesus Christ. And it's about the spirit and power of God. And what you have sitting in your lap is the power of God right there. And he said, your problem is you don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to stop here real soon. Just give me another minute. I'll pick a good stopping point. That's the privilege of, of teaching through here. He says in verse number 4 is where we're at. Demonstration of the spirit and power. Verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That says the perfect stopping point because verse 6 switches the foot here for a second. We'll get to that next week. You know what he wanted them to do? He wanted them to realize your faith ain't in, well, my pastor's so smart. I mean, if that's the case, BBC, I'm sorry, you guys. You got it bad. I ain't never claimed to be the smartest guy in the world. You want to know something? I don't even care. What's your IQ? I took a little fake test, a cheap one. I'm not telling anybody what it was. It's that embarrassing. <laughs> Just kidding. 
I have no idea. To be honest with you, I never take a real, took a real good one. And I don't think it matters. Right. You know what I believe? I believe if you stay in that book, God can give you wisdom beyond what your IQ is even capable of. And you might be the lowest IQ in the room, but you got enough of the book in you, enough of the Spirit of God in you, you can outshine people with twice and three times your IQ level. Your faith doesn't need to be in the wisdom of men. Your faith doesn't need to be in your pastor's education or somebody else's knowledge of the originals. Your faith needs to stand in the power of God. God hath in these last times manifested his word through preaching. I think that's Titus, ain't it? That's how God manifests the word of God. You want to know what will happen to you if you stay in church and keep coming? Can I say this? And I, I guess I'm guilt tripping you just a little bit. And I, think it, I think it's okay at the right amounts. Your kids? I don't want you coming to church for your kids, by the way. But every once in a while when you're tempted to drop out and you're kind of hanging on by a thread because your relationship's failing, because your backslid is the devil and you know it, why don't you stop and think about it? You know what your kids need? I pray, I pray, I pray, I pray daily, God, make yourself personal to every one of my daughters. Make yourself personal to Anna. Make yourself personal to Sophia. Make yourself personal to Ava. Uh, Lillian, sorry, honey. Make yourself personal to Ava. <coughs> Poor Lily. She's the name we always skip over. I don't know why. Is, at least we're not calling her Rona. She's downstairs. <laughs> That's the dog. God, make yourself personal to them. Ain't that a cool name, Rona? We bought her during coronavirus. Rona's a female Norse name, means mighty strength, and she's a black pit bull, so it's kind of perfect. But anyways, that's a different subject. <laughs> God, get them. God, get them. Show them your power. You want to know one of the ways God does that? Is when they get in the car, and they're on the way home, and they, have, they know Dad doesn't know what they've been Dad just got done preaching, but that wasn't Dad preaching. Dad wasn't up there gunning for me, using the pulpit to try to straighten out my family. That was preaching. That was God, because Dad doesn't even know. That is one of the ways God will show your kids the power of God, is by doing what you're doing right now, having them in church right now. You can't have that happen week after week, month after month, year after year, and not begin to know there's a God. And you don't really need the fair speeches of men because, man, you know. You know what I hold in my hand? The sword of the Spirit, which is, you can finish it, the Word of God. The manifestation of the Spirit and power The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and morals and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's why preaching manifests the word of God. Because I'll preach on something, and I know this for a fact, I won't even be talking about what God gets you on. How many times has that happened? You're like, real good message, preacher, I needed that. And I'm like, well, you know... <laughs> And you're like, yeah, it had nothing to do with anything you said, but God really got me. Thank you. Amen. And that's what Paul determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I'm going to do it the old school way. And I'm just going to show you God. And I'm going to refuse all the rest of it. Now, next week, we'll pick it up from here in verse number six. He says, How be it? And I'll show you what that word means in English. And he goes right from that to saying, But we're not idiots. That's what he's going to say. So this whole, I might not know as much, but I know as Jesus. That don't cut it. Amen. Open your Bible anywhere, it's all good. I've sat in church before. I'll never forget it. I sat in church before, and the guy got in the pulpit, and he said, well, I'm just still not sure where the Lord wants us to go, but I know he's going to tell me. And I was sitting there praying about where God wants us to go, and I'm not sure where, where we're going to go. But the Bible says, open thy mouth wide, and I'll fill it. So I'm just going to open up my mouth for Jesus. And they all start going, Wait a And then he starts getting off. And I'm sitting there going, I ain't giving you a love offering. You didn't work. Man doesn't work, neither should he eat. Open thy mouth wide, and I'll fill it with your foot, idiot. 
Why? Because that's a verse out of context. That ain't Bible. Folks, what you and I need is Bible and the demonstration of the Spirit and the power of God. And boy, that's what I pray for. All right, we'll stop right here for tonight. We'll pick it up in verse 6 next week. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, we love you, Lord, and we need you. And God, I ask with all my heart for you to show us the demonstration of the Spirit of God and what He does and how He works. And the power of God, Father, by manifesting this perfect book that you've given to us, which we, God, we're so grateful for. And I ask you to help me, Father, this week as I study. It's going to be a busy week and a lot going on. I pray you'd expedite my studies. I pray that you'd guide me and direct me for Wednesday night, for Sunday morning, Sunday night. Be with Brother Joe and Brother Dan, God. I pray you'd get all over them and I'd fill them with your word. And God, give them the courage to cry aloud and spare not and, and just dump out everything you give them on the young people this week. And we beg you, God, to keep us safe. Give us a good week. Bless your church. Give your people wisdom in these crazy days and how to navigate through the world in which they live. Give them peace with the decisions that they make. And help them out, God, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks for being here, guys. You're dismissed.